All right, today I have my buddy Ryan on. Um, he just did Boston, and he's going to go to the uh, Ironman like World Championships. So I wanted to have him on and uh, briefly talk about some of the stuff that he's doing this year. So for starters, Ryan, if you want to give a brief intro about yourself. So actually, um, I guess I somewhat have a cardio background, but not really like endurance. And actually probably complete opposite of like what I do now. I grew up wrestling my whole life, wrestled from – second grade to my senior year. I had some offers to wrestle. I actually got hurt my senior year though and didn't get the scholarships that I wanted. I ended up joining the Marines. Uh, I went the recon Marine route. So I went through like the combat jumps or the dive school where I got more confident in the water. Did a lot of like ruck marches, essentially like PA trail running with like weight on your back. And, and I guess that gave me a little bit of an endurance background. But uh, once I got deployed, I got into bodybuilding like heavily and then into powerlifting. I mean, I was into powerlifting as much as I am into endurance sports now. Like I put so much into it. All I cared about was getting, picking up heavier weight every day, like eight. And I mean, I lived by it for probably six, seven years, like not missing really a lift. And then, uh, yeah, I got into endurance stuff actually at the Rachel Carson. I don't know if you know that trail challenge. I actually signed, signed up for it on a, I was talking to the race director, helping my, I'm a city fireman now. I was helping my fire captain clean up a trail uh, just helping it. And I was like, oh, it'd be cool to do this challenge one day. I was talking to the race director. I had no idea. So it was a Wednesday uh, before the race. And that was the weekend before my wedding. So I did this 26 mile trail race with no training. It was the hardest day of my life. I barely could walk all week. I was like, what the heck was that? And it was just like, eyes were wide. I was like, ever since then, I was never turning around with uh, endurance sports. You know, it's just, I really enjoyed it ever since. It's like nothing's nothing is hard as especially ultra running. It's just like so intense and incredibly tough. Uh, people don't understand that. So yeah, that, that must have made for a, a nice wedding and wedding night. That not being able to walk for a week. Oh man, I could, like, <laughs> I swear, thirty. So it's a thirty-six mile uh, mile challenge. It's actually a hiking challenge. So you can do it in the summer solstice, and it's you have from sun up to sundown to complete it. And there's a lot of hikers. And so I was doing it with my fire captain and I was like, we're just going to hike it. So whatever, it's going to be a long hike, but I'll be able to do it. And right before the day before I was at the firehouse, a senior fireman walked in. He's like, I've done that thing twice. He's like, it changed the directions. I did it one year that way and one year back the opposite way. And he's like, I actually even did it one year hiking. And it was like traumatically worse because you're on your feet for so much longer. So I remember like that going through my head. And I was like mile eight hike, and I was like, oh, I'm going to start running this thing. I started running past all the hike piers because we were walking so slow up these hills. And, yeah, it was just uh, – I think it was like – I did like 10 hours. I mean, it was – I had like my training at that point wasn't all bodybuilding. I kind of got into CrossFit and stuff as well. But uh, definitely nothing endurance like by any means. So that – I did that, and I signed up for an Ironman before COVID. but covid hit so it was all transferred transferred like twice because the races all were canceled so i was just like it was just all my emails and it was a month later i had a 70.3 uh ironman and i was still like i was like 190 not 200 i was like a 220 but i was still down away it's like 195 200 pounds i did a half ironman and i ran a 428 which is like going sub 430 like people train for years to do it and i was like oh maybe there's something here and I qualified for the Ironman World Championships for the half distance, um, my very first race. So uh, it was like I almost didn't want to do it because I was like still that had that ego of being the big guy. I was like, I don't want to do cardio and lose any weight. And I was like, this will be like my last race and stuff. Uh, I'm going to get back to bodybuilding. Um, you know, all that ego of being the big guy. Uh, I had to let it go. Just <laughs> try to focus on endurance but uh, i took some time for my brain to switch gears you know <laughs> but now i'm all in how how many iron mans have you done whether it be half or fools so i've done uh two two halves right now and or three halves and two fools um my first year i did that half and then i a month later i did maryland so i had like a little bit of an ego going to that full distance and i biked with like as hard as I would on the half distance. And I came off on that marathon. I could not, 
I think I ran like 8.30 the first mile, and then I flicked off the mile marker, and I was hobbled. It was like the longest marathon of my life. I was like running mailbox to mailbox and see a mailbox and like walk two steps. And, All right. And I'd be like grandpa hobbling to the next one. I think my bike split was like five hours, which is pretty good. But my marathon was like five hours. <laughs> so, but what, uh, like people don't understand is like when you transition, I've done a couple like duathlons, like where it's like run, bike, uh, run. And once you get off that bike and you start running, it's like, yeah, I, I say it's like ghost legs. You're like, you know you're moving, but it just feels like your legs aren't even there. Yeah, I think it has something to do with the biking too, because like you're moving so fast on the bike with so little effort. Then when you run, you're like giving less effort, and you're just like not moving. So like feels like you're like it almost feels like you downshifted your bike to like the lowest gear, and you're just like spinning. But uh, and you also have those really heavy legs. Like I don't know, for trail runners, it's like because you do a lot of trail running, it's like going up that one climb. Um, on call of the wilds. I don't know if you know that climb. It's like a 1200 foot climb in one mile or something, but it's just like being on like, like one of those, like this is a big long climb, but it's like, you're on that for like four or five hours where you're just like kind of like power hiking. And then you get off on like a road and you have to run fast. It's just like your leg muscles are just so spent. And then it's like all turnover. So it's like, I, I don't know. It's a tough thing to train for. Yeah, it definitely is. Cause like, we'll just, cause you know, I did Hunter this weekend. Like we did some hill climbs and then we like did descents and then we hit this one road. I'm just like, man, my legs just feel like they fell off as soon as you hit like a like an access road. It's just completely different thing when you're doing one set of gears and you have to transition to another. It's just it's horrible no matter what discipline you're in. Yeah, it's like it's kind of cool because like when I look at trail racing, so I've like compared the two kind of like mentally in my head. No, it's not like any scientific, but like mentally in my head. It's like trail racing, it's like you're switching that like you from those climbs, it's almost like it reminds me almost like bike strength. And then you're like running flat and then you're like going downhill. It's like almost like a weird, the downhill is a weird thing in, this, in itself. And then you're hiking back up these hills, like hard hiking. I mean, you can try to run them, but uh, it's more like that biking, like slow turnover, kind of like power climbing. And then you're running again. So it's like you're switching where it's like Ironman is like, you're like, if you would compare it to, it's like being on the hill for super long and then a big road to the top, you know, <laughs> that's how it reminds me. It's like, you're just taking each, I don't know. It's, but it's a cool, uh, cool sport the swimming is also really a cool thing about triathlon being the open water swim uh that's that's pretty cool uh, i remember my first race was up in maine it was a beach start and it was like the sun was rising and you could just see the buoys and the police boats just like sitting on the water and it was like just swaying and then my buddy was with me you hear the gun they kind of send you off like a roller coaster like five at a time and it's like probably a five to five or six second deep count and they keep sending like people like in waves of like four so i remember like the sun was rising even by a fist bump we walked up and we just ran down the water right into the beach and it's like you hit that water it's like it's you're awake you know <laughs> you don't hit water and you're not still asleep but, like instantly you're getting kicked in the face you're just like packed in it's like off the bat uh that's but, kind of the cool thing about that one so I, I did hear there is a little bit of well, it would say like jostling or you know a little bit of elbowing maybe a little bit up in, in the swimming part oh uh, yeah so like the crazy thing is like and i didn't even really pay attention to it much early on but now that i'm getting more into it is like if you ever watch the pros swim it's like the most craziest looking thing ever because the dude that's leading the pack he's like like so i'll swim like probably five or three to five strokes before I look up to see if I'm like heading on like the right heading. And even sometimes I'll just, you know, you get in someone's feet and you can just like follow their feet almost. But these dudes in the pros, they're looking up so often. It just looks insane. They're like moving their arms so high and they're looking up and they're just like, those dudes are just so vicious, man. Like you get in those big packs. And the one thing about swimming is if you get in a too fast swimming lane, someone's like, like a, a group of people come and approach you. It's like, you get ran over. It feels like, <laughs> <laughs> you know what i mean it's like because it's just they're cruising yeah I, I did hear that a little bit it's kind of you don't see that too much in like the other disciplines um a little bit maybe in like cross country like high school I, I always hear about those kids getting some elbows and stuff up front but like just road running in general you, you don't see it too much except for maybe like a pittsburgh race where there's like a thousand people those if you're not there early enough you don't get up front but nothing like a swim would be uh for an iron man no yeah it's uh the thing about the swim course though is it's like it always is different it always presents different challenges 
Uh, sometimes you have a wave. Uh, Iron Man World Championships get extremely cold water, and the sun was like right where the buoys were. So like sighting was really tough because you just look up. Um, so I'm talking about seventy point three Iron Man World Championships out in St. George last year. The water was really cold, and the sun where it rose was like right in your like viewing point for the buoys. And like when you're a spectator, you like look and you see the buoys so clearly. But then whenever you're like actually swimming, if there's any bit of wave, your eyes are really only this far like above the water. And if you sit up, you're only this far above the water. So like a rolling wave can make it really hard to see that buoy. And then you have goggles that might have a little bit of water in them. They're never like super clear. And it's just like you're getting ran over behind. So it's like um, – pretty uh can be pretty intense but the swim parts are also pretty cool like uh the one swim i did last year was my full ironman i did out down chattanooga and it is considered one of the faster swims because you're swimming down river but that's kind of besides the point because it was just such a cool experience you're swimming underneath these big bridges uh just going right into the downtown it's like almost swimming downtown in Pittsburgh, but the water's not as nasty. It'd be like, you know what I mean? But it's just like this real city vibe. And uh, it just was so cool swimming down there. And you swim across path these boats and stuff. But then when you come out of the water, you're just like, when you swim, it just wakes you up. And you're like, come out. And you're like, been swimming for full Ironman. Usually it's about an hour of swimming. Half Ironman, about a half hour. Uh, and if you're going underneath that, you start getting a lot more elite Uh if you're underneath those times, that's where you get more competitive. But uh you're just like kind of moving around so much, like in that rhythmic swimming motion. When you stand up and the water's cold, you're kind of almost disoriented and you're kind of like all wobbly trying to get your wetsuit on and you're on a bike and you're like soaking wet, cold, and it's still kind of the morning time. You start picking up those watts. And then uh the bike racing part, like for people that run a lot, is it's a really fun part of the race that runners don't really understand. Like because those TT bikes are so fast, like it's not very hard to get 20 miles per hour on a TT bike. And you're just, you're not allowed to draft, but like at the same time, unless you were like a high school or college swimmer, you're going to have your, for me at least, a lot of people like that, if you were to get into it, probably be the same way. Your bike leg will be a lot stronger than your swimming leg. And even, even the people that are like college swimmers, there's going to be a lot of those people that are just naturally really fast in the water and not very good at biking. So you're coming out, you're passing all these people and, um, at first on the bike, you need to kind of calm yourself down because you can get really excited, you know, because you're like, got the water, just got on the bike. And then uh, for the half iron, man, 56 miles, you really have to crank that. Like, there's not really any like um, sitting around, uh, like, not, you're like pretty much 100% the whole time. It's like maybe 95%. Um, then you go, then you transition to run. But for the full iron, man, it's tricky because that's a, that bike is such a long time like in the full it's actually the bike section itself is longer than a whole half iron man so if you it's like you want to be going hard but it's like it's you have to pace yourself but to be competitive you have to push yourself there's like a real weird like trying to draw that line you know what i mean it's a tricky race to pace yourself say from an ultra standpoint to an iron man standpoint is on a bike you can eat a lot more. Like it's a lot easier on your stomach to eat and you actually get hungry because your stomach's not getting jostled around so much. So probably a gel or a honey stinger um, every 20 minutes, every hour. So, I mean, I was putting a lot of fuel myself compared to like ultra running. Uh, so it's like quick turnover. You feel like you're not moving at first. And uh, my last Ironman, my full Ironman, I came off like the back was kind of stiff and I was so worried because my first experience was so bad. I was like, uh, and I felt like I was running slow and I started getting my laps. I'm like 620, 630, of 610. I'm like, oh, I'm moving pretty good. And people are cheering me on like, you look great, man. Your turnover is great. And I felt great. And uh, the course in Chattanooga gets real flat out and back. And there's a real hilly section. And you do it twice like a figure eight. And these hills are like, it's probably three miles or 500 feet or probably or so climbing and like three or four miles. So it's like for road running. It's like, it, they're big hills. Like, like they put heartbreak, heartbreak hill in Boston, all those little marathon. It was a hill. It was no shit a hill. And on the backside of an Ironman, I was like running and I tried to run those hills hard 
And then I got back on the flat and it was like, my legs started to slow down. I tried to get it. I couldn't get like stuck at like a seven thirty mile. I couldn't pick it back up. It's like starting to feel that stiffness. And right around mile 18, it was like, and then I had to hit the hills again. And man, it was so brutal. That back half the last like five miles of that marathon, I was running like 10 minute miles. I mean, you're up a hill and on the flats, I was still running like probably sub eight minutes, but I was like just so much more locked up. And, uh, Thank God it only happened like the last like six, seven miles of the marathon. So I got pr- raced the beginning up into that pretty fast. Uh, but it was enough to qualify me for the Ironman World Championships. Um, and the way that works is pretty neat too. So like you go the next day and each age group gets so many slots to count up based off the number of participants, not based off of uh, – amount of talent so if you just have a tough age group you could kind of get screwed and it can kind of be the luck of the draw so like um so what happens is like if you have 500 people you might get three spots and if an age group had 200 people but say they place more people high up doesn't matter they would only get like one or two slots to kona and then they they give awards out to the top five in every age group and first come first serve so like first person up do you want a spot to iron man world championships yes or no and if you want it, you have to take it right there and then. And, you know, it's a business like anything else. So they're making their money off those Kona tickets. They're in cheap. I think it was like $1,400 right out the right out the spot, right? And uh, I ended up not being able to take it because Kona was going to be on October 13th. So I, I couldn't take it. Uh, so I kind of raced off my numbers. Didn't really take the spot because I was like my cousin's weddings that day. And then they announced that. Uh, the co-ed Ironmans are over. They're going to do girl day and guy day, which they did last year, but Kona couldn't support a two day event like they did last year. So they moved the guys to Nice. And uh, I was like, oh man, I could have done it if it was in Nice. Uh, then I got an email saying, Hey, we moved it to Nice. We gave everybody a chance. Like, would you want to do Ironman championships in Nice? I was like, I don't know if I could like afford a trip like that like i have other, like i have other stuff like weddings and family obligations like anybody else does uh but it was really cool i called my coach my coach is like take that because it gave you they only give you i think 24 or 48 hours to respond to the email and then it just basically moved on to the next person so i was kind of excited but i was like I, I can't afford to go out to nice there's no way and i called my coach and he's like no he's like we'll figure it out he's like all the guys on our team love you we'll figure it out we'll get a good fun. we'll get it all He's like, just take that ticket. We'll reimburse you. Just we'll figure it out. We'll just get you there. And I was like, all right, man. Like, let's let's just figure it out. He's like, he's like, all right. He's like, take the ticket, and I'll talk to you later. So I called my wife, and she was like all excited about it too, because she knows how hard I was working for it. And um, so yeah, it was crazy, and I couldn't believe how much support I got. I like, I had the whole trip like basically mapped out how much money I need to raise, and I raised it within like two days. Like, it was insane. And it was just so cool, man. It's just like, I don't know, sometimes these endurance sports feel lonely and you're training a lot of hours by yourself and you're like, well, do I have any friends? Like, kind of like, you know, it's like you're doing a lot of lonely stuff and you meet a lot of good people along the way, don't get me wrong. But, um, yeah, it was just so cool to see all the support I got, you know? Yeah, I, I did see that because I saw you posted about it. I don't know if it was like a GoFundMe or something. And then like, it was like, oh, I'll look back at it another day, like the next day. And it was like, I heard he made his goal and I'm like, well, damn. I was like, that's awesome. Yeah, man. So yeah. So now we got the money raised. I bought the tickets. So we're going to go out there and race it. Uh, yeah. It's going to be incredible though. So the thing about that is Nice actually has a lot of history. People understand. It's like the Kona of Europe it is the first time they did an Ironman in Europe was Nice. And uh, what, it's going to be where cool is exactly Nice or like what country is it? It's in France. It's right on the Mediterranean. And it's like the bike portion is going to be incredibly hilly. So this can be cool because, and I, and, and from like a pro standpoint, it actually like is cool that they're moving out of Kona because Kona was like, it's tough, but it's like its own kind of toughness where it's like humidity and really hot. And that's why it's tough. And there's sometimes hard winds and stuff. And that's why it's tough. But like a certain athlete strives in that, you know what I mean? By it doesn't mean they're necessarily the best at Ironmans. They might just be the best Ironmans in Kona. And so they could win, like, and it, it was kind of cool to put it in Nice because it's not as nearly as hot, but the the bike is going to be a lot harder in the sense of, like, elevation and climbing. So it's like a whole different type of athlete almost, which is cool. 
for the pros. Like the pros probably for a long time should have been moving the race, but it is kind of sad for like the amateur because like Kona was like the Boston for like ever, you know, it was like that, um, this that symbol of like, I, I don't know, tra tradition, I guess. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, but they'll, so they'll switch it. They're switching every year. So this year the girls are there, but the next year the guys will be there. So they're switching right now between flopping between Nice and Kona. And I don't know how that long that will go on for, but that's the current uh, situation. Now, since it's in, you said it's in France, would that be any of the um, Tour de France course? So I think they do bike. I, I don't think it's a course. I mean, it means like, I think they do bike through that area. I'm pretty sure they bike through. They, they most definitely do. Yeah, because like as soon as you said France, I was like, that would be the question I would want to know if it was like a, a stage in the Tour de France. Yeah, I bet you. I, yeah, I actually, it's a good question. I was like curious about that, but I never really dug into it. Oh no, you know what I did? They didn't release the bike course yet, so I don't think it's going to be like a, a tour. But I bet you that there probably might be some segments that are like from Tour de France. That'd be pretty neat. That uh, once the course gets released, it'd be cool to figure that out. Yeah, um, I mean, it's. I mean, granted, you're going there for a different reason, but just like that little bit of history, say, oh man, Tour de France went through here. That's like to be able to be on that. Even if it's for like a hundred yards, just be something cool to say you did. Yeah, so the seventy point three World Championships changes location every year. Uh, where the full used to always be in Kona, but the half distance it started in Vegas and it's been all over the place. So they actually had the half distance World Championships there. I think in two thousand nineteen. I might be wrong, but it was recently they just had the World Championships there for the half distance. Yeah. No, you talked about drafting on the bike. I actually didn't really realize this until probably last spring that you're not allowed to actually draft at all on the bike. Yeah, it kind of stinks. Like in the big, the only people that get drafting, like they hit drafting with, is like people that are like leading the race. Like if you're in the back of the pack, a lot of people are drafting off each other. Um, but yeah, you're not supposed to be. I think it's five bike lengths, and it's like they're pretty strict. Like there's people driving around with the. I actually got a poundy in Ohio <laughs> last year, but it was, I'm still upset about it. It was like a, so I was like, so you can go up and pass people. When I come out of the water, I'm just flying past people. Right. And you like basically like use their back and come up on them and like slingshot off them. It's just, everybody does it. You like come up as close as you can. If you're going to close on them pretty quick, I'm going maybe five miles per hour faster than the people I'm closing. in. so it's like, they're going 19, I'm going like 23, 24 miles per hour. And I was like, just shooting past them. Right. Just zipping past them. And I went to zip past this one person and this guy, I didn't see him. He was like on the outside, even of me. And he tried to like, he tried to pass me at the same time. I was about to pass that girl. So like I was past her. I didn't know he was on my side. So I was had someone on this girl and I went to pass her and he was like, cut me off. So I almost crashed into him. So I just slammed on my brakes. I went back behind that girl for a second, picked up my speed. And then the bike, the one that penalty guy caught me and he was like drafting. I was like, are you kidding me? Like I got, and the thing that really pissed me off is, that guy, he was he was biking out of his means. Like I passed him like ten minutes later. So he like like I passed him like fifteen miles later. Like he shot up real fast, and I passed him. I didn't see him. But that five minute penalty, you have to not only stop for a full five minutes. Like if you think if you're going through it, it's right before the finish line. If you think about it, stopping for a spot like you're biking twenty miles per hour like this. If I have to just stop and then get going again, that loses a lot of time. And then just stop, tell him the penalty. They put a timer. They find like they're they're not they're not pros. So they take a second to get the timer going. They mark your thing and then you go. So it's like a seven minute penalty. And then you're caught your breath and you're trying to like catch, play catch up. So if you get a drafting penalty, your your race is pretty much over. Unfortunately, I'm a new Ironman and I'm one of the guys that could tell you that I've already had a drafting penalty. <laughs> yeah, because I, I know from running it, I do notice the difference. And even biking like on rail trail just with friends, it's such an advantage. I understand why they don't allow it, but at the same time, it, it's part of racing. So it's it, that was one of those rules that I was just like, I think they should just throw it out and just let people do it because it, it makes the race more interesting. It's yeah, more so like strategy. the distance they do, Olympic distance, they kind of biking like that. It's like the Olympics, if you watch them, they're not on the TT bikes. But the only thing about that is, is like if you had a pack like that, it it would be like – it'd be more of like a less of a test of endurance, more of a test of like bike skills, because if you're sitting in the back of a Peloton 
you can bike significantly less energy than if you're like pushing. Like for example, I'm a buddy of mine and we went out biking. He was just out of my tail, which would be kind of cool though, because if you have someone that is not as like good a biker as you, they can kind of sit on your tail and it makes a bigger difference the faster you're going. Like, and we looked at our watt differences and I think I was average like 220, 230 watts and hit and his was like 170. <laughs> so then like, that's a huge, that's a lot different. That's like running sub seven minute mile and run like an 830 like that's like the amount of difference of effort it's like quite a bit so it would become a, a sport of less uh endurance and more skill bike skill if it was like that yeah oh, I, I always like the strategy of like in race strategy so that's why i always say that um so what is your favorite of the three disciplines for the iron man so i'm probably i'm probably the strongest on the run because I came from like, I grew up run, wrestling and running all the time to cut weight and stuff. But I probably, it's, it's weird because I enjoy the biking and running so much, like training wise. Like biking is really cool because you get on those country roads and a lot of trail runners, like it almost has the same feel like you're out lost on a trail, like trail running. And you're out on those country roads, just going past farms. There's nobody, you haven't seen anybody for a while. And you're just on these back country roads. Like it just has that free freeing feeling, uh, like that trail running almost has, like that like experiment, like ex like experiencing and exploring, and kind of gives you that same uh, feel. So I just love biking. I love running, just like the joy of it. And it kind of sucks me to do track work or like essentially do those kind of workouts. But it's more of a, I guess you have to get more of the feel of things. Uh, the one thing I don't like doing is going to the pool, which is my worst finding work on the most. I'm very, so I'm very confident in the water and I did make a big jump in my swimming. I like all with this, uh, a swim coach last year and he like really corrected my form. And, uh, I came out like I was coming out like 150th out of the water and at Ironman Chattanooga, I came out like 32nd out of the water. So I, I did put a lot of time into swimming. Uh, it's just such a grind because you're usually swimming in the pool. You can go swim in open water, but you really need to be swimming in the pool mostly to keep your pace because you can't really check pace that well out in open water and you have a clock you can kind of do the keep your pace do drills and stuff so a lot of the swim work has to be done in the pool um you can practice to get comfortable out in the open water for like newer swimmers but once you're comfortable out in the open water and stuff you understand that it's mostly pool work and that can just be a grind because you're not just grabbing oh i'm just going to grab my shoes and run out the door just jump on my bike outside the door you're driving to the pool and then you're like, oh, man, you're sitting on the side of the pool. You're like, I don't even want to jump in. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah. So I think it's cool if you can get a group to swim with, but um, a lot of hours by yourself, you know. So how do you generally train, say, like, hours per week, like, for this discipline and that discipline? Or, you know, what's your general training strategy or routine? So the, the thing about triathlon is it's, like, there's a lot more moving parts than ultra running. Like ultra running, like in reality, like I don't want to take shots at anybody, but my boy Trevor, he like always runs 10 miles every day. And and for ultra, that like works great. Like you just need to get a lot of volume in for ultra running. Um, but the discipline about Ironman, it's like it succeeded like in only endurance. Like at first it was like, can you complete this crazy distance? And now it's it's long enough that it's, a, it's an all day endurance event. Like, don't get me wrong. It's a hard, long endurance event to complete. But then if you're trying to compete at it, they're very set distances. Like you can get fast in them. So you, and especially the half distances in the Olympics, you have to do a lot of VO2 max work where it's less endurance. Like, and, and your building has to be a lot smaller, smarter. Like my first year in, like into endurance, like last year was probably my real first year. I was trying to do everything. Like I signed up for world's end. I did, uh, Rad Raccoon 100K. I did a couple 50Ks. I did Grand Fondo down in uh, Maryland, Garrett County Grand Fondo, which is like 6,000 or feet of climb, 120 miles on a bike. I biked down to DC, which is a 350 mile bike ride from Pittsburgh. I was like, but the thing about doing all that is that's not a smart approach because it zaps. Like that might work for if your goal is to do a crazy endurance event, like a 100 mile, something that's like, you know, just that all day endurance. But to be good at Ironman, you can't only be doing that. You also have to be getting that VO2 max at speed work. It's really important. It's really important to be doing all those things in those different disciplines. So um, for biking, you're 
paces are based off of usually watts. You know, this test is called an FTP test, functional threshold power. It's like probably pretty much like 20 to 30 minutes of like you're all out, like what you can do. And there's different ways you can test them. But every way you test an FTP is going to hurt. <laughs> like it hurts. Like, and it gives you your, your, your zones and you basically do different workouts off, off those zones. Um, I remember like my coach basically would have me do like these FTP repeats and they'd be like, and they're like, like hard, whatever. It'd be like your hard, it'd be like basically your, maybe your 10 K pace essentially. Um, and it'd be like, you'd be like five minutes on two minutes off four or five times through. And then it's like build by the end of the time you're building these endurance models. You're also building that. And wouldn't really necessarily try to increase your FTP. Be like more like, can you try to get that FTP to be held longer essentially? So it'd be like five minutes, four times, the next five minutes, six times, and it'd be like 10 minutes, two times, 10 minutes, three times, and 15 minutes, you know, and then just keep building bigger and bigger blocks and then re FTP. So that's kind of how your bike works. Plus, plus, you know, and ton of amount of just like hours in the saddle. Um, that's your longest amount of time. So you'll do your long and easy rides. Because of that, that takes a lot of volume. You have to kind of like balance the discipline. So your run drops down a lot. So your your run could be off the bike, but you still want to do be doing speed work. Uh, it's the same way that you're balancing the three different ideas, like that speed, that endurance, and like time on feet. But you're balancing with biking. So it's you don't ever want to forget one aspect. So it's really tough. That's why having a coach early on in triathlon is really important. Like even the pros that like know racing in and out almost all have coaches just because the nature of the beach, it's so much easier to follow a program and take your emotion out of your programming. Um, Cause I know last year when I was training for my full Ironman, I, there's no way I would have pushed myself nearly as hard as I would have without my coach. Like, it was ridiculous. I think my max week was 350 miles of biking, uh, 50 miles of running, and like 20K of swimming. So it's like three to five hours of working out every day at some point. So it's it can be pretty brutal. Um, so with the three different disciplines, balancing, it's really tough. And it's a lot more hours than ultra. So like whenever you compare the two, uh, from everybody I've ever like listened to on YouTube, and I agree as well, 100 mile ultra runs are definitely like the ultra stuff's definitely physically and mentally harder. Like to finish the actual race day, it's just harder. Um, but the train for the Ironman is harder and more time consuming because you're trying to be so good at, at three different disciplines. And to be competitive in an Ironman, you can never be like redlining ever. So you have to get your endurance so high that you can have a good pace without redlining. So it's a tricky sport, that's for sure. Um, and for training for it, it's like the best way to train for it is open all doors to everything. Like you're going to be doing speed work. You're going to be doing long work. So it's like, there is no trick, you know, it's not like some people in ultra I do this. I do that. It's you're doing everything. Speed work, endurance miles, time on feet, time in saddle, long swims, a lot of quick speed work, kick drills, pool drills. It's everything. So, <laughs> uh, it's tough. That's why it's good to have a coach for that. If you would ever want to go that route. Yes. Being a, like any, anything you do in life, you know, specializing in different skill sets always takes so much longer than just trying to specialize in just one certain thing. So I understand where you're coming from. Like, like time-wise, just you sort of have to uh, put everything else in life on the back burner, I guess. Uh, for, if you're doing a full Ironman and you're doing it serious, like you can do the 70.3s, but when you're like three months out from an Ironman, like, and if you want to do good, like qualify for Kona or like be competitive for something, that, that is 100% of your life. And it kind of does stink because you do end up sacrificing a lot of stuff and putting a lot of stuff on your back burner. Um, I guess it's just what you want out of life. So uh, the 70.3s in the Olympic distances, like they created the 70.3 so that athletes could race more in a year. Because, yeah, it makes sense. You have to, yeah, you can do those. Well, a lot it, more. It's a little bit of this, too. Oh, absolutely. 100%. <laughs> those dudes, exactly, man. 100%. <laughs> like, I, I know what's going on behind the scenes with, with some of those issues with Iron Man right now. Um, but anyway, Do they buy you? Do they get that ultra? 
I'm pretty sure that Iron Man bought you TMB. Yeah, I think that's how it went, or or vice versa, or whatever. But they're gonna bring one UTMB or something to the United States. Now I I forget how it was. I was just like, I'm good. That's just more money that I don't need to spend. Yeah, that's crazy. It was cool though. I was up in the when I was at the Boston. I did this shakeout run with this like influencer, and I was talking to a bunch of different guys, and I can't remember the kid's name, but. He told me he's an ultra. You know, that's like my second love. I do like ultra eventually. One, one year, once I get done with the triathlon, I'll life or whatever. Once I do what I run in this course because I'm stuck on it right now, I'll definitely get back into the ultra world. But I was talking to this kid either way, and he's doing one race. And he was telling me he's a hunt. He's like, like you shooting for a time at Boston. He's like, not really. It's like more of a training for uh, like um, an ultra race. And I forget the name of the race he told me, but he said it was a hundred miles, three thousand or 38,000 feet of climb. He said you, you like, hit 14 feet or 14,000 feet of elevation, like, six times in the race or something. I can't remember all the details, but uh, he, I was like, where are you training for it at, man? He said he was out in Nepal. I was like, you're out in Nepal? He's like, yeah. Like I was like, where Mount Everest is? And he, I was like, he's like, yeah, I was running around the mountains out there. I was like, I was like, you mean, like, someone He's like, no, I was just, like, backpacking around. It was so pretty over there. I was like, yeah, I can imagine. That sounds pretty wild. And he was telling me he's, he lives in, like, we're like, so where do you live? He's, like, loosely out of Boulder. <laughs> like, he lives in a van outside of Boulder. All he does, and it's like, you find these crazy ultra athletes everywhere, man. They're, they're it's a lot more of them. That know. almost sounds like Mount LeBlanc, I think it is, maybe. That might be it. Yeah, I think that's the, like, I if, I could be wrong because if I say it, if it's the race, somebody will say I'm wrong and I'm an idiot. But I believe it's like Mount LeBlanc's like the UTMB like championship. I think that's the name of it. So that and it is like thirty eight thousand feet. If I, yeah, yeah, it was so cool, man. I was like, dude, it was insane. And he showed me some of the other videos because they put a bunch of crazy races on. Those races are just like next level. It's like I can't even imagine getting more of a messed up course than like Eastern states, like. It seems like some like the devil made Eastern states. Like, like I don't know how you can get more elevation than that. <laughs> like a more you have to literally just be on a hill the whole time. It has to be literally you to, that's averaging three three hundred and eighty feet of climb per mile. That doesn't make sense. That doesn't make sense. <laughs> yeah, there, there there are a lot of like twelve hundred foot climbs. I will say European ultras are so much. I don't want to say harder or better, but their climbs and stuff are so much more ridiculous with those mountains than they are in the United States. Like you see our top athletes going out to like Walmsley and like them trying to compete with some of those European studs. It's yeah, they, they're, they still get blown away. That's just like their next level, next level. Yeah. It's like, they almost are all doing exactly <laughs> like Lipsy. He's a freak athlete, but that's, they're all doing that. They do that backcountry skiing in the winter time where they're just like hiking those mountains so they're just climbing elevation like crazy all the time. And, yeah, you said this, but they're just on those hills for so long. Those climbs are just like hours of climbing. That's uh, You have to train that. It's a whole different type of athlete. Yeah, that, yeah, like Zach Miller, he goes over there a couple of times and did the race. And, like, he's a next-level athlete himself. But, like, it's just so hard to train unless you're actually staying. I forget who stayed over there for, like, two months or moved over there just to train for it. It might have been like Walmsley. It's just it's just so hard to compete because there's they were born in that element, so they just have that. Ele- um, yeah, the back to begin with. Back to feel. Believe me, that's how I feel when I go out to Central PA, man. <laughs> like you guys get this in your backyard. Come on, <laughs> us Pittsburgh. We only have, and like in Pittsburgh, we only have like three hundred foot climbs. I think if you get lucky, you might be able to make up some four hundred foot climb, but that's about it. You, then you got a central PA, it's like you get 1,500, 1,600 foot climbs, like no problem. And yeah, it's like uh, you get, get the uh, no, like because I, I respect the Amish and Mennonites 100% like the work they have, but like they're running these troll races in like pants and like boots, and you're just they're flying past you, and you're like, damn. So, what did so what's his name that has the course for eastern states? Uh, he is Amish. Um, and uh, king? was it a king? Did, 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 but I, I so I know he was an Amish kid. I don't know. Did he like actually wear running clothes though, or was he like, like what, what was his attire like when he ran those races? I, I, I think he, I I can't remember his name. I thought it was a king because there's like a bunch of them. But 
I know he was wearing like a normal shirt and shorts, but he carried like a handheld, like a like a not even a big one, maybe like twelve ounces. And I think they said he only drank like water during the whole course. <laughs> I, I could be wrong, but that's what like that that was the folklore. No, nah, he seems like one of those people that would just like you know just be a, just next level because he has the, the record at um what the heck's the name of that course, uh, World's Ends, the hundred K still. And I remember Aaron was trying to go after it. And I was, I'm pretty good friends with Aaron. Uh, yeah, I can't remember the guy's name. I would feel bad. Yeah, it starts at W, I think. Uh, yeah, whatever. But either way, he's he was a monster, man. And then he just, like, what? Just got up and was done with it, set the records, and just was like, all right. I'm yeah, done pretty running. much. <laughs> well, he's a, I, I talked to him a few times. Really nice guy. His family's awesome. His family came and supported him. Like, I talked to them, and I was just like, well, dude, I was like, your son is a, like, I would tell him, I was like, your son's amazing, man. I was like, you raised one heck of a good kid. Yeah, that's pretty, that's pretty next level. That's pretty cool though. Um, that's a cool thing about the Pennsylvania trail running though. It's like, uh, that's why I was so upset. I was like FOMOing so much, <laughs> but I spent all that money in Boston and I, and I really wasn't physically should have, I just gave a real tough effort at Boston, but that Heiner challenge, I was like, I was at work. I was like, oh man, I wanted to be there so bad, but, uh, I'll get there one year. It looked like such a cool trail experience. Well, there, there's better. Well, I don't want to say better, but there's more trail races that are a little bit harder that, you know, to get into and maybe more of a challenge, I guess. So I did call the wilds a couple of years ago. That was a pretty awesome trail race. Yeah. I think like that's, one of that's where Eastern state, I think ends that last couple of miles, like where the rattlesnake den and stuff is coming in the pine Creek. Yeah, I think they start and end in the same place. Uh, there's, I know that I know that Eastern States has some of the um, trails uh, called the Wilds. I think I don't know if he's made it public, but I'm pretty sure my buddy Aaron's doing the uh, Eastern States this year. So, like, uh, I'm gonna hopefully if he does do it. I know he's having some foot issues, but I think he's trying to get back to running. If he does it, I'll be pacing him for about 40 miles of it. So I'll be excited to get out in those trails. Uh, I won't be racing. <laughs> You say, you say that now till you see them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. I know. It's like a love. So you were talking about Boston. You uh you ran the Boston Marathon. Is it uh last weekend or something now? Yeah. Um, how did that go for you? And like, how was your experience there to begin with? That was the single handed craziest race. Like just weekend everything. Like there's so much tradition in that run, and like that marathon in general there's so many people that come for that and the cool thing about that race is it's not just americans it's like people from everywhere and everybody you talk to is like because qualifying for boston is like decent like achievement in itself like you're a pretty decent athlete if you qualify for boston in general you, you know you are a good runner if you're in at boston the Boston Marathon, like, you get on these buses, and I've never seen so many school buses. I mean, they were projected 30,000 runners, I think 27 or 28,000 ended up running. Uh, just people didn't show up to the start line, but the school buses, like, on the way over, I've never seen so many school buses lined up. So you have to, like, uh, and you experienced it, they wanted us, I was in the first wave, uh, like, the, they had these different waves, and they had different heats inside the waves. So I was in the first wave, six G or whatever. Maybe I'm saying that backwards either way. You'd have like, there's four of them, and then they were broken down to like eight. Uh, and they'd be the color of your bibs. So I think the first group was like red bibs. Second group was like yellow bibs and white or blue or something similar to that. I'm not, I might I might be wrong, but I know I was red in the first first like corral kind of thing. And um, they told us to get on the buses at 645. So I take a bus over there at 6.45 and the race doesn't start till 10. Um, we probably, it took us about an hour to bus us all up there and it took about 15 minutes to load the bus. So I'm sitting, get there about eight o'clock and it's just like this giant field behind the school. Like, and you're just under these big tents, it's raining. It's like, I didn't, I didn't really have that good of clothes um, because you have to bring clothes, like throwaway clothes. Like you just, you can't like, so you basically are supposed to like bring clothes from the Goodwill and they donate them. So I brought an old pair of running shoes because I was like worried about getting my carbon shoes wet. But I wasn't thinking because I have a little kid now and I was with my wife. I didn't bring any clothes. So like we went to like try to find Target and stuff. It was like all like ransacked. So like I just took the oldest clothes I had with me up 
and my dad gave me like this button down like shirt and stuff and either way you're like just trying to stay warm um and i was like sitting in these tents and i started talking to people i started talking to this guy he's from uh london he's talking to me about the london because there's a six majors some girl butts in the conversation she's from berlin and like I started talking to all these people around me and not one of them was from the United States. So that's like a pretty cool thing. I say like you're at a race and you're not like, there's people from everywhere at this race. So then they tell you to walk like, okay, walk over to the start line at like whatever, nine 15, we're going to start lining up. So you start walking over to like a mile and a half walk. And right when I'm starting to walk over, like they have all these bags. So I start taking off my clothes, my tank top. I'm starting to get a little chilly or whatever. And right when you get up to the finish start line, it starts to rain, like a light rain, whatever. But people don't understand when you get to the start line, man, you're getting these crowds and they're packing you in like you're at a, like a festival, a hippie festival or a Woodstock. And it's like, you're so close to each other. And the only time I ever ran a marathon like for a race was the Pittsburgh marathon last year. Um, like seriously, like I did a couple like small ones for Wolf Creek, but I was just like, just going out there and running for miles. So like I took the Pittsburgh serious and, uh, um that's how i qualified i ran a 258 45 so i barely qualified but it was like two weeks or three weeks after rabid raccoon maybe two months i can't remember it was after rabid raccoon and i was still not like fully recovered from running 100k because that was my first 100k and it really broke me off um and i ran that, that race and it was cool so i qualified for boston um with that time never really ran a new time so they put you in your finish time based off of your best your time your qualification time so i was at like a three hours so i was running all the people about running three hour marathons my goal was to run a 245 um and i but i didn't really know what my marathon fitness was i could like i could run like a 238 a 240 or 250 i really have no idea where i'm at so it's kind of like uh, a surprise for me to see how i was going to finish my goal was to shoot for a 245 um and I just started running and I was just like, oh, I feel what I thought I, it's all perceived effort. I didn't really like try to hold a certain pace or anything. Um, 615 was what I was trying to shoot for. I was closer to a six minute mile. But the thing about that is I was running with those three hour people. And like, you've been in that race. The first six miles is like running in like a, a concert size crowd. Like you're so close to everybody. And I'm running like, probably six i was running like a six flat at that time for six miles i was under a six minute mile and everybody i'm running around with is like running like probably 640 650s at first at least so i'm like weaving in between these people uh since you started with my bid numbers since where you see that like kind of where they think you're going to finish 5931 i end up finished like 649 or 650 overall so essentially i had to pass over 5,000 people essentially, if not more, to get to where I finished at. So I'm running down the inside. It starts off the downhill, and you're so close to everybody. It doesn't really, it's hard to get open, like get your own running pace until you hit about mile, the first 10K. And then the race really starts. And, but it's crazy because that race is packed from start to finish. You're running next to somebody at every, every given second. You're shoulder to shoulder with somebody that whole entire race. There's people cheering. It's a 26 mile long party. Like, from the start line to the finish, there's somebody on the side cheering you the whole way. And even on, like, the more scarce parts. And then for people that's never ran the, or have heard about the Boston, it's mostly that net. It's more net down than up. But there's still quite a few bit of feet elevation going up that it makes it a tricky marathon. Uh, and around mile 13 or so, there's a girls' college that comes out, and they cheer you on. <laughs> and it's called a kissing mile. You can stop and, like, yes, some girls will kiss, but whatever. I was running too fast, but either way, it was – it was funny because they're like you can hear these girls screaming from a mile away, and you just and then you like you're you're running and it's like almost on a slight downhill, and they're like on the fence like screaming your their head off like it's such a cool thing and you're just running down I give them all high fives and it's like it's such a like it just gets you so motivated and hyped up because they're all just such loud cheers, and then uh, you get down to the bottom of that hill kind of planes out right around mile sixteen to twenty is where you get all the hills at. But they're like little towns, and there's a lot of people cheering you on. The last one being, well, second to maybe the last one, or maybe it's the last one's Heartbreak Hill. It's really not like for trail runners, it's nothing crazy. But like for like the Eli Contrape, really like Eli Chogi, whatever his name is, for the people like him, those little bit of incline really can throw off a 430 pace, you know. 
but it's like a half mile. I think it's like maybe nine hundred nine ninety ninety Yeah, to a hundred feet yeah, of. it's yeah, it's only like ninety feet. So it's like Yeah, it's not. it's it's going like a up a block in Pittsburgh, basically. Yeah, it's really like nothing. Like for yeah, for me it was like nothing. I was like, this is hard for. I thought it was a joke, but uh, it definitely makes it harder when you're trying to like PR, or trying to hold like a a sub six minute pace. Like when you're really trying to be on your pace, it makes it tough. But then uh, the finish was really cool. Coming down to the finish line, there's this triathlon group. They're called uh, EMJ, Everyman Jack. Uh, it's a shaving company that puts on uh, a pretty exclusive team of triathletes, usually some pretty good triathletes on that team. And uh, I had a couple of a friend on it and stuff. Either way, I saw them. And uh, I passed them like mile seven. Um, and the one guy said to me, he is like, He said, hey, Arms, like you look pretty good now. We'll see how you look at the end of the race. So uh, he like tried to pass me like a mile 23, and uh, we ran the last 5K, and like I took off the last 5K. Like It was like basically dropped the clutch, like opened up like you're the last mile and hope you were finished. Well, I think I might have opened up too early, and uh, I was fine for like for, when I hit mile 25, like 25 and a quarter, the last like mile, maybe even kilometer. everything started to walk up on me, man. But, and it started to pour down rain. It was crazy, but it was cool at that point. Like I'm going past all the like historical signs, like the sick sign, And then you're coming downtown. So I was like walking up, but it was cool. Cause it's like probably the best mile in running. So, I mean, I was in a bad way the last mile. Cause I think I just took off too early. Um, I was like cramping everything, calves, hamstrings, biceps, forearms. I think it was, I was like, If it was any bit of a longer race, I'd have been screwed, but I held it together for the last mile or so. And I just, at that point, I was like, who cares? Like, I smoked my time I wanted to beat, and I just tried taking the cheers from everybody. You turn that last bend, you see that finish line. It's like running in the center of a football field. Max volume, everybody's screaming. It's like, it's the coolest finish line in racing. It's like, if you run, don't run marathons, you run ultras, you should just try to qualify for Boston, just experience it once in your life. even if you're not trying to run your heart out or anything, it's just like, if you're just a runner, you would just appreciate it uh, of any background. Yeah, I, th I think the crowd carries, like, no matter what kind of day you're having, whether, you know, good, bad, or whatever, the crowd just carries you through from start to finish just because there's so many people. Oh yeah. It's just like this insane event. Like, uh, it's a once in a lifetime kind of event. It really is. And running with that many runners, like I can understand why some people don't really like it or like, might not like, Oh, I like to do my chair. Like I get it, but it's just like, it might not be your favorite race. You might not go do it and be like, I, this is my favorite thing. I loved it so much, but it's just so much different than anything else that it's like cool to be part of, I guess. And to know like the best athletes in the world are pretty much there. Like you have to put some of those, all of those marathon runners that are running those, sub two tens like the two oh fives and those people like they have to be some of the best endurance athletes ever to live. Like it's insane. I don't think they get enough respect. But those marathon runners at the top level are just such insane athletes. Yeah, see, I, I sort of feel bad for you, but at the same time I don't because when I went in twenty eighteen, like my weather was just it, they said it was like the worst year for weather. And I was inexperienced at the time like with the knowledge of like the whole tent situation and like four hours like a four hour window from like start to finish so like i always tell people i was like you guys got to pre uh prepare for this because if you don't know you're gonna have a bad day Oh yeah. Oh yeah. So I, I thank God I joined some Facebook <laughs> Facebook pages about the Boston Marathon. If it wasn't for that, I would have had no idea. Like people were, I think were taking pictures that year. Was the tents like all muddy that year? There was oh, someone yes. that, from like a couple years back. They're like, you should bring throwaway shoes. This is a picture from the waiting tents a couple years ago. It's like a mud pit. I was just like, holy shit. Like it looked like it was brutal. Yeah, I, I think I had a plastic bag over me, and I was ser seriously not enjoying myself. I was sitting on the ground in a ball, waiting like two and a half hours before they even called me with like no food because they said they were going to have food, but they had like a handful of bagels that just give you like a quarter of it and some cold coffee or hot chocolate that day. <laughs> yeah, man. It's, yeah, so I, I, I was a little bit more prepared, I think. 
I just brought a bunch of like honey stingers and stuff, and I ate a bagel when I first woke up. One thing I like to do, I drink a lot of caffeine before any race. Um, people think it's actually like it doesn't help you, but it actually is. A, caffeine actually is a performance enhancing drug to test for the Olympics. So you actually can get like benefits from drinking caffeine before racing. And so I, I'm like, whatever. And I love my, I'm a caffeine junkie as it is. So I always drink like an energy drink before I run any drink, any, any, uh, race might be, um, not the best for my heart, but <laughs> it's part of my ritual now. <laughs> well, I, yeah. I drink, I drink at noon with the caffeine in it. Like for my longer runs now, and it just gives me, keeps me that a little bit of mentally focused gives me that little bit of a, a performance enhancement, which I think I would crash a little bit without the caffeine. Oh yeah. I, one of my gels, I'll eat a gel. I, I eat them every 25 minutes. I wish I should have ate them every 20. I think that's where my, I, I did like every 25 because I was like, well, I'm running and my stomach might, but I had no stomach issues or GI issues. So I pushed it back and I didn't have enough with me. I literally just, cause it's a marathon. I just carried my gels in my hand. Like I didn't have like, Oh, back pocket. I literally just fist held them. Like I just ran with them in my hand like this. And I was just like eating them when I like hit a water station, throw them off to the side. But how have you ever I don't know if you remember this. Do you remember those water stations in the Boston? No, it was no, just no. so crazy. There was all the cups along the side, and there would just be like this one girl because they just give you these water cups. And there was girls at each station or, or whatever, just volunteers. I don't know why I say girls, but there's volunteers at each station, and they'd just be like, um, room or like have literally like a rake and they just rake and like cups off the side of the road like constantly because <laughs> so many people there's like this giant pile of just like paper cups you know on the side of the road and it just uh it's like holy cow just like the the operations and the setup of that race must be like a logistic nightmare but it oh, seems like they run it pretty smooth honestly like i mean it seemed like everything went real smooth from my standpoint well, I mean, they have what 127 years of experience now. They ran out of medals. Did you hear about that? Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, that was one of the things I was going to say about like all the controversies this year. That, like, like you're saying, the medals, like people taking two, and you know, there was a, apparently a lot of bandits this year and stuff like that going on. I just, I, I as much as I think Boston is a, such an achievement, at the same time, I think it's a little bit overhyped. And some of the things that they're doing, it, it's just like it's starting to tarnish the race itself. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it is. Uh, the cool thing about it is it's just the melting pot of people. Um, the one thing that I, I will say, though, like to give Boston the upper hand is Boston itself, like the locals there, like Boston people love Boston Marathon runners. Like they are proud to have the Boston Marathon there. Like, for example, I was talking to this girl at the starting line or in the tents. She's from Berlin. Uh, she spoke really fluent English. Like, I guess she went to, like, an English-German school like, where they had to speak and write and do all their, like, assignments in English. So she was, like, really easy to communicate with. And we were talking, and um, she was telling me that she's like, yeah, she's like, I love I love the United States. Like, they care so much about their marathon runners. Like, everybody's so about running and stuff here. I'm like, that's just the Boston marathon. Like, that's just it Boston. Definitely Boston. But that's not, like, if you go run a small marathon, like, on the side, no one gives a shit. Like, she's like, at Berlin, uh, like, they don't really care that much. I was like, yeah, well, in Chicago, they don't really care that much. Or, or Pittsburgh, they don't really care that much, you know. I mean, you get some support, but it's not like Boston. Like, that's one thing I will say is the ball amount of volunteers that come out and help out are so nice. Um, and the amount of, like, just the locals, they drive, like, uh, jag off. But when you talk to them in person, they're not usually nice people. <laughs> Yeah, getting in and out of the city in a car was hectic. <laughs> Man, that city is insane. Every time I get in the car, I was like, this is the end. <laughs> yeah, There's like I no don't... line of sight. People drive like insane. People double park. They just like throw their blinkers off and on and just leave their car in a lane of traffic. You're like, that's the thing? Okay. <laughs> yeah, I definitely remember how bad it was around Fenway coming in and leaving. It was just, I'm like, how do you people drive like this and not die every day? And if you miss a turn, it's like it's like these you guys like get over five lanes and get on a turn and then five lanes the other way and you're doing that. If you miss a turn, like people like don't give a shit. Well, like you'll be stuck on like a, a berm for like no one cares. It's like yeah, it's a crazy city. Um I don't know if you got to go up to like north uh north end Boston, but there's a whole section of a bunch of Italian restaurants 
and uh that was real cool after the race i think we just went to like we went to like cheers and then that place that has those uh the pastry place uh bovas maybe whatever the yeah, whatever the famous like thing of the cream in the middle uh yeah i'm not sure did you go to fenway no i didn't like we we did like, i didn't either i didn't know that was a thing until like way either. down yeah so apparently i guess you're supposed to, you go run the boss marathon for anybody that's listening to this podcast that goes and does it the tradition is if you run the boss marathon you go to the Fenway Park. They let you into the baseball game for like five bucks or like three or something. It's like pretty much super cheap. So the tradition is run the Boston Marathon and go watch this, the game. So that would have been kind of cool thing to do, but I never made it there. I think the game was actually like noon or one o'clock this year. I think it had to get yeah, moved up or it was like postponed from the day before or something. Yeah, I think it was this year. It was like during the, the marathon or something. But usually it's after. Yeah, because I, I, this one woman I know, uh, Tanya Bond, like her and her husband, uh, Randy, like I saw pictures and stuff. Like there was just like a whole crowd, like in the stadium lights were dark, but there was just a shit ton of people inside the stadium. I was like, well, that's cool. Oh, yeah, well, they did something that. else after. I don't know. I, so I talked to that one girl I was telling you about this <laughs> at the tent. She told me that one uh, German girl, she told me that they do some event, I guess, there for the runners after like food or something. I think they did the maybe they did the awards there for like age groups and I don't know exactly, um, but yeah, apparently they did something for it at, at Fenway after I, I didn't make it that far, so I kind of I ran so hard, man. I ran like I ran a two forty, so I was really pumped with my time. And that last mile, like I was hurting, and I was really trying to push like as hard as I could. And I finished, and I was fine. My legs were a little bit tight, and uh, I don't know if you ever get this, but I do, and I push really hard. I just, I just always do. If it's cold at all, if I'm running, I'll be fine for like 20, 30 minutes. And I get this like really deep chill. Like even if I just, even if I like run in and get in my car and seated, like I just like kind of chilly for like an hour or two after the run. So I went back and got a hot shower. I pretty much dipped right. I got the heck out of there right after I finished. Cause I wasn't in the best, best of ways. I, I, I put it all out there on the day, you know? Well, I think it's just because you're like, you're re redlining the whole time. So your body's just trying to regulate your like body heat. So then, like once you stop, stop and cool, it's still in that um, cool down mode for a couple hours afterwards. Like I'm with, I'm like that with any distance race that I run. Like even this weekend, it was like sixty degrees. Yeah, exactly. I, that's a, yeah, it doesn't yeah, exactly. Any run you do, you're right. It kind of gives you that like feel. The thing that uh, that people don't really understand about marathon running that might like run ultras. So they might understand it a little bit different, but a marathon, like when you're running a sub three hour marathon, like is no longer like the cliche, like marathon, like the tortoise wins the race, like go out at a conservative pace. Like, no man, like you're ripping it. Like you're ripping from the start. Like you're running hard. Like a two forty is almost two forty is almost a six minute mile pace. And I would have been probably right at a six minute mile. If I didn't fall off that last mile. Um, uh that's that's like going so hard right off the guns like people understand that like even when you run that like ran for a marathon people are like oh well, that means like he can just like run a six minute mile easy it's like no like if i do a workout and i have to do mile repeats at 10 miles per hour or six minute mile like it's still like tough to get my leg that's still punishing on your legs it's still like you're still going to be breathing hard so it's like you're going out so intense and you're just like relying on your training to like hold you together like i don't think you understand that like i like like Elliot uh, Kipchoge, he's running so fast out the gates. Like it's literally insane. Like you're using so much leg strength at every given second. Like if you just miss, like he missed one water bottle handoff and that like pretty much was his race. Like they're so dialed in like, and I know you're not a big fan of him because he gets everything get handed to him. But, but I'm just saying it's like for all those level of athletes, it's so dialed in it's so intense. It's not like an ultra marathon. Like we're now like the hundred milers, like more like, what people thought the marathon was like for the uh, ultra community, like the hundred miles more like the throw it out conservative. If you're going to need it at the end, like the marathons like this, like run as hard as you can and hope that you get to the finish line before you run head first into a wall. Kind of thing. <laughs> you know what I mean? Cause you, you even saw that like to me, my biggest thing was with him. Kipchoge is the drafting this week. Uh, the other weekend is it's just like, we were talking about a little bit earlier is, drafting saves so much energy and like they would not let him 
Paul, draft at all. Man. Yeah, they were like pushing him up front. That was great, man. I did see that. So I watched it like, you know, I watched it after. Yeah, that was that was a big like I think that really hurt him. Like yeah, I did. Because- I think that was the biggest reason why he didn't finish like with the record or you know winning the races because he's so used to having people draft and break that win for him. And people don't understand that it's such an advantage to save. I think it's at least like 20% of energy if you're like behind a draft. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it is. And then, um, yeah, because they're running like almost, what, 12, 13 miles per hour. Like, that's so fast. Like, that's – like, it almost looks effortless when you just see them running by. But then it's funny when you see someone like biking. Like, like if you're biking 12 miles per hour, like, you're actually like – not just like sitting on the bike you're actually starting to pedal like somewhat you know what i mean like that's so fast like that is incredible how fast those guys run so getting off of boston a little bit uh what are besides like your uh champion iron man championship you have any other big plans this year uh races that you're going to be doing yeah so they have a new series of iron mans this year and um, they released the one race the same day I got the ticket for the Boston Marathon, like the same day I got accepted in there. Um, they're doing one in Pennsylvania for the first time this year out in Central PA. They call it it's, – it's Happy Valley 70.3, so they call it Happy Valley. But it uh, starts out at uh, Bald Eagle Reservoir, which is out by State College, like Penn State. Um, and you swim there, and you bike in. You actually run and finish inside of Beaver Stadium, like at the center of Beaver Stadium. So when I heard about that, I – that was like almost instantly my A race. Now, since then, I've got Iron Man World Championships and a couple other races. And I have a wedding to go to the night before. So I don't know if that's going to be my A race, but um, that's going to be a super cool race to do. And that'd be really cool because everyone will be there. I know like everybody that I know that does triathlons, uh, friends, because it's like a lot of Central PA trail runners are going to come watch it. It's just going to be a crazy weekend that weekend. Um before that, there's another one up in – before it, about a month before, is up in Western Mass, Springfield, Massachusetts. And I have family up there, so that's going to be also a really cool race for me. But uh, those two are before. All right. So what kind of – I always like to ask is, like, what what's your favorite, like, shoe or, like, your favorite bike, that you like, the gear that you use? Uh, so, obviously, in those races, you're going to use carbon shoes. Nikes are probably the best carbon shoe if they work for your feet but like they don't work at all for my feet um from every bit of review i've ever seen they always say like nike is like the shoe to go with but uh it doesn't work with my foot it was like it rubbed on the inner inside of my foot it was like two for two narrow foot so then last year i ran in the um asic meta speed sky i liked it a lot but i had a lot of heel rubbing in it it felt like there was uh, not much to the shoe, so my foot like didn't rub like in a certain area. But when I do a lot of speed work, my heel would kind of get uh, rubbed raw, which is kind of weird. I did the heel lock, and it like it still kind of rubbed a little bit. Uh, but that was the shoe that worked better for my feet, foot. So I had a lot of experience in it. I just got those Saucony Endorphin Elites, and that was the first time I ran them in Boston. I did like two workouts before, and I'll tell you what, I, that was my favorite shoe I ever ran in my entire life. It just fit my foot so well. It didn't feel like a carbon shoe. It felt like a regular running shoe, but it had such snaps of a real, like a, a carbon shoe. But it just, it didn't feel like a carbon shoe. It just felt like a regular shoe. So that was by far my favorite uh, carbon shoe. Probably keep running with it for now. Um, and I, I'm sure that that technology is going to take off uh, every year. It's going to be a better shoe because it's so new. Um, last year, I biked with a Quinn Bonnaroo a QR bike, um, but I just upgraded my bike to a, uh, I went to Trek. Uh, I think I was losing a lot of power because the carbon frame was like just basically dumping car, dumping uh, watts when I bike down and just the, the frame would just bend and just, I'd lose watts. I got this um, concept, um, speed concept from Trek, uh, SLR7, I think. I think it's the name of it. Um, it's like the one below the top model, but it has uh, electric shifting and I got a pretty good discount. Uh, so it was like, that bike is just so fun to ride. It's so fast. It's so f- incredibly fast. But uh, yeah, it's uh, like owning a Harley Davidson with payments. <laughs> yeah. It's uh, I'm not bikes about, are but... definitely expensive. Oh uh, yeah, they're like um, buying a brand new. Yeah, they're definitely like buying a car. 
Yeah, I like so I like Trek. I like Specialized. I like Quinpanaru for bikes. Um, I would even get Canyons a pretty good bike as well. Those are the kind of bikes I would look at. Those brands if I was looking at biking. Um, yeah. So running shoes, carbon shoe. That's a thing that uh, I use the Saucony Endorphin Elite, and I'll keep with that shoe probably all year. Um, but that's like the runner. That's all preference, run preference. I don't think I wouldn't say it's necessarily the fastest shoe on the market. So I've heard the good things about other carbon shoes. Yeah, I think that the, the winners at Boston were like in the uh adding zeros, a lot of them, like four or five out of the top six, like three of the men and then like two of the women. So it's kind of neat to see that it wasn't like Nike this year. Yeah, yeah, I think it's uh Nike just has the market from early on, but uh, yeah, I definitely think that those other shoes are starting to come around. I've seen some stuff about the New Balance look like it's pretty cool carbon shoe as well. Well, I'm a I'm a Saucony guy myself, so I, I'm as soon as I get some money, I, I got the Endorphin uh, threes now, but I'm waiting for the Elites so I can drop some more money on those. Dude, they're sweet, man. You would like them. You got you got to try them, dude. They're they just they fit like any other Saucony. So I I've only had one other pair of Saucony's, my. I was actually getting signed up for Rabbit uh, Raccoon. I walked into a run sh shoe store, and um, yeah, I tried a pair of Saucony's on. She was like, "I need a new pair of trail shoes," and she's like, "You should try these on." And I tried them on. I forget the actual model name. I was like, "These hug my feet so well." And then I got those carbon shoes. Like these also work so well. So I only had two pairs, and so far I might be bought into the Saucony too, man. <laughs> I had two pairs. I was a Brooks guy. I've done a little bit of everything. You know, I, I put I've flat feet. So I've ran like a million different shoes. I'm like, this doesn't work. This doesn't work. This doesn't work. Saucony's and Brooks uh, seem to work the best for me. I, I, I like the on too, but they run through real quick. You run through ons like so fast. I actually got flat feet myself. And like I said, I'm Saucony guy. And like the Peregrines and stuff for trail racing, they're, they're my go-to for racing trails. Which one is that? The, the, yeah, Peregr the Peregrines or whatever they are. It's so whatever it is. Like, he. Yeah, I'm gonna see the ones Saucony Trail shoes. I'm gonna see the ones if I can figure out the ones I have real quick. I'm looking on. I think it's like you, you got the like Cohesions excursions. Those are like the lower ends, and there's like Kavinkas or Venas or something like that. But then it's yeah. it's <laughs> Peregrines are supposed to be like their endorphin, like basically shoe. They're a game. I'm not going to try to say this one. I have the Saucony. It starts with an X. X O Exodus. Exodus Ultras. Uh, they're, I like them, but they're a little bit of a heavier trail shoe. Uh, they have a lot of support. I like them for long miles, just like just kind of cruising. They're a good training shoe. Uh, I don't think I'd race them, but that's ones I have. I yeah, really I, like the way they fit. I think so they're, they're like for, an ounce heavier than like the Peregrines. They feel pretty heavy. I'm not going to lie. I feel like you have bricks on your feet. But they're like pillows, so they're really comfortable for just like logging miles. Uh, well, I, I wanted to share this because I didn't share it earlier. Is in Boston, like as you're saying about being cold, is since my year was all rainy, I, I had to have my parents hold up a towel in the middle of the subway, like right at the finish line, and change clothes because it was so wet and cold, and I was just shaking. Like I, I literally dropped my shorts like naked. I was naked in the subway in Boston. <laughs> <laughs> yeah man it's a yeah my car so i, I snuck out the corner and i jumped <laughs> in my parents car right away i i got out of dodge like right after the race because it my i had a my son uh he's only three months old and it was raining and they're like we need to get him out of the rain so it started it was like kind of drizzling and it started pouring down rain so they like rushed him to the car and then i, I, I like literally was like walking like barely like, walk at the end like hobbling over the car so i got out of there pretty quick but if I was had to stay around there any longer, I'd have been in the same situation because it's like you get so cold after you stop running, like we were saying, and um, you're cold at the start, so you get this such deep chill. It's like you can't shake it, and it was kind of it wasn't super cold. It was like probably mid forties, but it was rainy, so like being rainy and wet, mid forties, like yeah, you're gonna get cold. I don't know. I would have been screwed. I'm so glad I got out of there quick because I'd have been in the same boat, man. I'm sure there were smaller people in the same boat. So. Yeah. Um. All right. Well, uh, we got a couple minutes left, and I'll, I'll I'll get you out of here before ten, hopefully. Um, do you have anything else you want to say real quick or touch on? 
No, man. It's just uh, if you're going to race and you pick a race, uh, like an A race or something, you definitely should. And it might just be advice. It's definitely like um, you can build a lot of base fitness and be good at all different endurance events. You can be good at 50 Ks. You can be good at 100 Ks. You can be good at 100 miles. You can be good at Ironman. You could do them all and be average. Like you could be slightly above average. But if you ever want to excel, definitely need to be race specific about three months out. Um, and don't buy into any of that hybrid athlete bullshit. Like that's just somebody that was strong before they got into running. And if you really have a running goal, then focus on running. And if you want to have a strength goal, then focus on strength. Um, doing them both together is all right in the off season. But, uh, once you get close to the race, like two months out, especially if it's an A race, you got to be all in on it. Um, because if you're not, you're going to get smoked by a lot of people that are. And, uh, yeah, that'd be my, my kind of advice. Um, for anybody that's getting into endurance stuff. All right. Yeah. I think we touched in a roundabout way on a lot of the things I was going to bring out that list I gave you earlier. So I, I think we covered a good bit. Um, yeah, the we'll talk. Are you, are you going to be a pit? By the way, I can't remember if you're going to be at pit marathon. Uh, no, I'm going to be there, but um, my wife's doing the half. Um, so I'm going to be watching the kid and just cheering her on. Uh, I don't know. She was she was going to do it. She hasn't been able to train much because the new kid. Uh, she she doesn't. She just wanted to do it, kind of to do it. She's uh has more fun with it, and that's going to be a cool marathon. So I'll be down there watching and cheering people on for sure. Um. Maybe I'll go run in her bib and give her some crazy time for her if she doesn't do it. But uh, apparently, no, I'm not. But uh, it could change. All right. Well, I'll catch up with you down there in uh, like two weeks. Um, but before, You run it? Uh, as of right now. Yeah, I feel you. <laughs> I, I'm trying. I'm doing Grayson Highlands 50 mile of the day before. So I'm going to try to come and drive the six and a half hours back and figure out how I'm going to get my bib. Yeah, well, if you need a place to stay, man, I live, like, um, super close to the start. I live right on the north side, like, five-minute drive. Like, you could literally just, like, go down from my house and go to the start line. So, if you need that, just let me up, buddy. I, yeah, it's more or less like a place to park my car where I, I can run to the start instead of walking two miles. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and doing 150 miles the day before, man, that's going to be a brutal two days, man. <laughs> All right. Well, but I, I you're doing eastern states, right? Yes. So that I mean that might not be a bad uh, double down. Might be well, a little overkill. The drive is what's going to kill me. Yeah. Good um, luck, man. Before I forget, or well, not that I forgot, but I wanted to thank you for your military service and your continued effort to make sure that, um, I guess our streets and our um, area is safe as well. Being a fireman. Oh, thanks, buddy. Appreciate that. All right. Well, thank you for coming on, and uh, I guess I'll see you in two weeks. We'll, we'll make it a point to meet up at some point, uh, Pitt Marathon. Yeah, for sure. Hit me up, my man. Take care, All brother. All right. Take it easy. Peace.